Thanks, Sue. Um, really happy to be here, very excited to be able to present to all these lovely people. Um, as this slide shows you, um, I now work at the Central Queensland University, alas not in Queensland, um, but in South Australia we have opened up a new Adelaide Research Institute and I head paediatric sleep research there, that's on Green Hill Road, but I also, um, in, with my other hat, am a clinical psychologist and treat children's sleep disorders, so I have a really special and lucky um, ability to be able to move from research into clinical practice. So one, the clinical practice that I, that I give is based on research and the community um, talks that I give is based on the latest evidence that we have. So tonight's um, talk will be based on both my um, clinical experience and my research experience. How much sleep do kids need? Okay, so I got this off a popular website um, about sleep needs in the age group that we're talking about. Now, I just noticed that actually that top line, daytime sleep for 18 months, that's clearly wrong. Um, well, I, I think it's clearly wrong. I must have um, cut it down, uh, copied it down incorrectly because at the age of 18 months, most kids will be sleeping, napping twice. And that's what the popular media says. But this is what the popular media says, your child should be sleeping 11 and a half hours exactly, and they should be, their total sleep would be 13 and a half hours exactly. Um, at two years that drops down a little bit and they go into one nap and then they have the other one nap. So this, um, it's very, very prescriptive is my point. Now, it's very clear in the media, it's very clear in, in the real world that that's actually not the case. There are 60% of kids who fit into a little box that is really quite predictive and prescriptive. There's 40% that don't. So I see the 40%, of course, in the clinic that don't. But the majority of us won't have a child that sleeps 11 and a half hours at this age. And I don't want you to think as parents, oh my God, my child's not sleeping 11 and a half hours. This is clearly terrible. It's not clearly terrible. And this is why I have a proof of a problem with prescriptive stuff like this, because this doesn't allow you to use your logic. So I just kind of done this, which is really what it may be. So you might actually have, um, at 18 months, you might have catnappers. I mean, they may be doing one nap, they may be doing two, but they may be doing four or five. It doesn't mean that that's wrong, it means that it's different. And it means that the total sleep time in a 24-hour period is really what we need to think about. A lot of catnappers out there, a lot of kids don't like to sleep the full hour or hour and a half, as prescribed in most books or um, other, other ways of getting information. Um, so the total sleep at 18 months, in my understanding, and that's looking at all the literature around the world, is somewhere between 12 and 16. That's a big difference. That's because throughout the world, all the toddlers of this, of this age group sleep somewhere between 12 and 16. So all we've got as researchers is to say it's somewhere in there. So if your child sleeps 12 and Joe Bloggs' child sleeps 16, you're going to be going, oh my God, not sleeping enough. Really, the only way that you can tell if your child is sleeping enough is if they're showing behavioural signs that they're not. <laughs> Doesn't help you much, does it? This is a guideline. That means that if your child wakes up grumpy and crying and upset and they're irritable and all those signs of sleeplessness or loss of sleep, you're probably not getting a child that's sleeping enough. But if they're sleeping 12 and they're bouncing and they're happy and they're developing and everything's going fine and the doctors are happy with their growth and development, you kind of go, well, they're not fitting into the mould, but are they okay and are we coping okay? Well, yeah, because it could be that they don't need as much. It could be that they cope with less. And I don't know the answer to that question and nobody does. So we have to kind of go, what might it be? As they get older, it becomes more clear as to how much they need. Mm -hmm. So I didn't put up a graph of how much sleep they need because I'm becoming increasingly aware that that's really unhelpful. I want you to understand that somewhere between 12 and 16 as a young toddler and somewhere between 12 and 14 as an older toddler. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even school age kids are sleeping that too. If I were to graph this, I would have in the middle here a majority of kids in the world sitting in this little block and the kids on either side sleeping a lot less or a lot more. And that's okay. How do they sleep? So it's important that we understand how they sleep because then you'll understand a bit more about what goes wrong with their sleep. This is a regular sleep pattern for a, um, a toddler and for um, a young adult up to the age of mm, 21. And then we've got the, um, older people. Now this, is, this interests us. Now let's see how this works. Um, we go to sleep, this is the awake state, we go down to stage one, two, three, four, gradually over about less than an hour for a toddler. So after about 45-ish minutes, and that's pretty clear in a toddler, that's kind of, that's not vague, that's pretty clear. 
we have the first sleep cycle, we stay into stage four, and then we're heading up to stay into the lighter sleep cycles to, to REM um, sleep, and then we wake up. So after the REM cycle, we wake up. REM is the rapid eye movement sleep, it's dream sleep. We go down again, oh, where are we? Go down again, and we come up again. More REM. There's actually a wake up there, most, particular, most often. Come down again, notice that there's another deep sleep cycle here, but the majority of the morning sleep is actually um, lighter sleep. Now this is a seven hour sleep cycle, and I'm hoping that your kids are in bed for longer than that as a toddler. So if they are, they're not gonna get any more deep sleep. They're only gonna get more REM and more stage one and two. Meaning that REM sleep, if they wake up at the end of every REM sleep cycle, they're gonna wake up. So take home message number 65. <laughs> REM sleep happens in all our toddlers. They have the most REM sleep and the most deep sleep than any other time in their lives. So their REM sleep is happening all the time. Therefore, they have potential to wake anywhere between five and eight times a night. So um, it's, uh, it's important to understand that one, deep sleep happens in the early part of the night. At the age of four, there is not even this one. It only stays here. So as a toddler, we're moving through this deep sleep cycle and we're trying to consolidate our sleep so that it only happens at the beginning of the night and the rest of the night is only REM. Uh, we don't, I won't talk about those because that's um, important. But this is another pictorial representation of that. Perhaps a bit easier to understand. Down to four, up to REM. Down to four, up to REM. And this is a four-year-old. There's no more deep sleep in the early morning. It's gone. This happens independent of me or you or anything else that we can do. It is an independent process. When children are napping once or twice in the day, one of their naps will be light sleep, one of their naps will be deep sleep. When they're moving, transitioning from two naps to one nap or one nap to no naps, that block of sleep that they're getting in the day transitions into the night time. They don't get more of it, though big time sometimes do, they get a different makeup of their sleep. So when childcare centres say to me, should, should we take away that nap so that that child will sleep better at night, that also is a very tricky question to ask because it depends on where that child is developmentally. So as I said, the major problems at this age, sleep onset association disorders. What happens at sleep onset? I call that the beginning of the night. No, seven, eight o'clock, the beginning of the big sleep period that we hope, we hope is a big sleep period. Children need someone or something to fall asleep with. Now, dummies at this age, toddler age, they can probably put their own dummy in. Though some kids don't. Can they not do it? Of course they can do it. Why don't they do it? Because mum does. Not because that's any way in vindictive or directive. They don't go, I'm going to not put my dummy in tonight just so that mum will get over here and pick it for me. Whilst they do know that one equals the other, they don't decide that before they go to bed. It kind of just happens. It's really important that we get that because kids are not vindictive. Well, I don't believe they are anyway. They just do it because it works for them. Any questions that I can help you with? I might come up with a boss of my sleep book uh, during the questions. Yeah. So the question is, um, can you, in terms of napping, miss the window of opportunity? We all, I think, know that there's a certain time that it's going to work and sometimes it doesn't. Can you miss it? <clears throat> yes, you can. How can you tell where it is? Mm, that's a million dollar question. Let's just say the best thing to do in that situation, if you feel that you've missed the opportunity, i.e. you've put your child down and they're not sleeping, they're going nutty, it's too stressful, or you think you've missed the window of opportunity, whether it's because a child won't sleep or they can't sleep is very difficult to tell at that point. But you need to decide whether it's worth the fight. There goes back to that flow chart. Is it worth the fight? You know, no. What's the worst that can happen? Your child doesn't sleep at that nap. And you might go, if they have a second nap opportunity, that's great. You might go, I'm not going to go through this stress. I'm not going to make this a stressful situation. I'm going to go outside and have a bit of a play, try it again, come back a bit later. That's the kind of thing that we talk about in our book. It's not an all or nothing situation. I want you to balance the stress of trying to get down a toddler because they must sleep. I need you to ask yourself, must they? Is it imperative that they sleep? Okay, then it's worth fighting for. If it's not, you can go, I'm just going to try for a little while and that Johnny doesn't want to sleep and I think that that's okay because you are the leaders here, Johnny is not, <clears throat> then you can say, oh, I don't want to go through this stress. I haven't got the courage to continue. I can't outlast him. I need to protect someone else's sleep. I have to get to pick up my child at school. A whole range of stuff can happen. Okay, so if that's the case for once or twice, that's the way it is. If that happens on a regular basis, 
I'd be thinking I need to rethink my routine, I need to rethink stuff so that I can actually make it work for me. But it's not a problem because all behaviours are learned and unlearnable. If it happens this time, it's okay. So I often say to my mums and dads, when you're putting Johnny down to sleep and you've got your new settling routine that is less dependent on you and you're teaching him, you might say, I'm going to fight this for half an hour. So Johnny's going to be in the cot crying or upset or in the bed and you're sitting with him or doing something, he might go for half an hour and you might go, if one's up stress, it's too stressful. You can choose to stop and go and do something different. Bearing in mind the fact that in terms of behaviour theory, I cry, mum sits with me, I cry lots, I get out to go out in the lounge room. That's a huge reinforcer in terms of reinforcement theory for a two-year-old to get. I just need to cry really, really loudly before I get out. But you need to know that, you do. You need to balance that with the stress levels. And only you can decide that. Okay, he won, if you want to call it that way. Okay, we missed that nap. But if this happens on a regular basis, then you need to think, okay, I need to rethink this because my ABC, XYZ is not working. Because something is not working. Yeah, so give yourself a break. Think about it logically and say, okay, I missed that one. Not, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to have a ratty child. I'm going to have a ratty sibling, something. I will get over that and work on the next one. Yeah. Um, so is there any chance of getting a nap back? Gave up a nap at 15 months and now to, to, at about two, you kind of would like to get it back. So you're saying to me, I suspect, looks like she needs a nap. And she's not doing it because we had a behavioural stuff going on. It wasn't that she wasn't tired, it was because we had behavioural stuff. So as a two-year-old now, you have more opportunity to explain things to her, to go through the boss of my sleep situation, to do this change of behaviour. You can not make her sleep. You can only make her follow the rules, that's all I can do. But if conducive to sleep is calm, confident and in their bed and quiet. So you say, that's what we're going to try on. If they don't sleep, but they're calm, confident and everything else is around there that's the same, then it's probably because they're not tired. But you have to put in place a behavioural strategy around it to enforce that limit. Yeah? If she's not tired and she's over the nap, nothing you can do is going to change it. But I think you're talking about behavioural strategy here. Hmm? Sorry, yeah? Um, question was, how do you get children to go back to sleep when they wake up in the morning? Two, three o'clock in the morning. Mummy, time to get up. Um, that's because probably they're working up out of a REM period, very light sleep, and they appear to feel alert because they're, they've just come out of a very light sleep stage. They, they're very aware, they're very alert. Now, if they have, on top of that, a behavioural interaction that reinforces that wakingness, I said, it's not the waking that's the problem, it's what happens when they wake that's the problem. You're saying to me, how do you fix that? Well, I will be putting in place an ABC versus an XYZ behaviour. What happens when Johnny wakes up? I mean, wake time. No, it's not, mate. Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. Tanty, tanty, tanty. Yep, tanty, tanty, tanty. But you need to ease him through the tanty. So you would, you would do exactly the same thing as I suggested at the beginning of March in terms of your flow chart, in terms of your behaviours theory. What are you going to do that's going to replace your reaction to him? Go back to sleep, mate. Um, he'll come out of his door. You can do the whole, I'll come and sit in the room, but you need to, otherwise I'm going to put my hand on the door and, oh my God, you want to close the door? That kind of stuff. So you use a behavioural strategy that is not punitive, that is choice-driven. Um, good idea to get that practised at the beginning of the night so that he doesn't, he understands it. Um, essentially, it's the same thing. Behaviour is behaviour is behaviour, and it can happen at nap time, 7 o'clock, or overnight. Yeah. So we have a um, question, how do we stop co-sleeping this child is 12 months and won't sleep in her cot alone? Um, you can do exactly the same thing, as I've said, behaviour theory says. So you would need to expose this child to something alternative to the cot. Now some kids hate the cot, hate it with a vengeance, and so you might say, okay, well I'm going to start by putting them on a mattress on the floor. She's 12 months old, she's going to run all over the place. So you might decide to take her into the cot and sit by the cot and pat her and put her hand through the cot and pat her. Hold her hand, do something. Needs versus wants. What does she need? She needs your presence right now. She maybe needs a bit of touching. Maybe she needs all the other stuff, dummies and stuff. Does she, she wants to lie with you. Does she need to lie with you to go to sleep? You know, she thinks she does. But if you weren't there and she was exhausted, she'd sleep. So you need to think about the physiological drive of sleep. If you're there to try and support her through, she will sleep. So if you believe that and you say, I'm going to insist on separating my sleep space from you, then you will often, um, I say to some parents, start by separating in the bed itself, 
put cushions down the middle. So, no, no, you can't sit with me. If that's okay. Oh, yeah, she's 12 months, so it's okay. So, there's no sense risk now. Um, um, but she will try and crawl on top of you sometimes. They want to be touched. No, no. If you want to stay in my bed, do you want me to stay or do you want me to go? Same old thing. If you want me to stay, you need to sleep on your side of the bed. So then you've separated touching. Then you might want to put on the mattress down the floor. She might run around. Do you want me to stay or do you want me to go? Same thing. You can use the same thing. The child will, if you get it and you make your limits clear, you will teach her bit by bit <clears throat> separating the cot, separating the sleep space, separating the room. You still need to, I think, give her as much as you can to make her comfortable because if you take another room and leave her there, she's going to be out in two seconds and then you're going to have a hell of a fire on your hands just to kind of make it a bit easier. So it's the same principle. Does that make sense? <coughs> Both protest versus distress. The question was, can, can, you tell, can you tell the difference between protest versus distress is the question? That's a really good question. The question is, so when a child is crying in protest, as per my little thingy, and then they work themselves up to distress, what do you do about that? That's a really good question. It's probably the crux of everything that we all stand for and everything that we do to stop doing what we do. That's the biggest barrier of a successful sleep program. So when a child who is a toddler, who hasn't got behaviour regulation to speak of, particularly not at 3 o'clock in the morning, they are going through this whole independence thing, their mood regulation is zero, their behaviour management is zero, but they're trying all this different rule setting stuff. They want something, they know what they want, they've learnt how to get it. They go for it, it doesn't work. It's what I call unfulfilled need, want. It's an unfulfilled want. Now you and I know that when we want something, we'll try for it. If we're determined and we're high on the hippie scale, nothing will stop me because it's, there's, I've got too much to lose. Well, that's what I perceive it as a two-year-old. So I'm going to go for it. So I can't stop that child from going into distress, meaning if an unfulfilled want happens, then physiologically the adrenaline starts rising, adrenaline starts rising, we turn into a fight or fight response. This is a natural, normal progression because even if you're there patting Johnny, unfortunately he might move into this distressed stage. All I've got for you there is to say, you know what this is about, you know why he's doing it. Does that stop you from picking him up? In my programs anyway, you pick him up. I don't ever say you can't pick up. Because I'm giving parents, I want parents to make the decision, I want to pick Johnny up because I want to pick him up. And no one should say to you, you can't pick him up. Particularly once you learn that all behaviour is learned and unlearned. So just because you picked him up then, doesn't mean you're going to pick him up for the rest of your life. It just means that now he's distressed and I can't stop him from getting distressed. So you pick him up and you calm him and then you start again. And you know what he's going to do when you put him back in bed? He's going to go nutty. He's going to go bunter because now he thinks, yes, God, damn, I'm back in bed. No, yes, no. It's a no, yes, no, yes thing. So we have to be aware of the fact if you, if you get behaviour theory, I cry, I get, I'm happy. I cry, I don't get, mum's going to teach me something else, but until I get it, I'm going to cry a lot. And it might move into distress. And Lord knows, I wish I didn't have to say that, but we all know that there are moments that we can't stop that from happening. But if you're supporting him through, you might want to think it's a bit like he's, in, he's fallen over and hurt himself, or he wants to stick his finger in the plug. Sorry, mate, you can't do it. Now, I don't care how much you cry and how much distressed you get, you can't do it. So it's the same kind of cry if you're there supporting him. And I wish I could stop him. If you decide to pick him up, and I encourage you to do what your heart tells you to do, then when you put him back down again for him to see his sleep space, he'll go bunter because he thinks that he's won the argument in terms of behaviour theory. So you can choose, do I pick him up or not? Most parents will, and then they'll go, I can't put him down again. Yeah, you can. But that's really your choice and it's your balance. <laughs> okay, the question is my two-year-old, did you say? So almost a two-year-old comes into my bed in the middle of the night um, after her REM sleep and uh, I think it might be a sleepwalking behaviour. I take her back to bed, she falls asleep immediately on my shoulder and I put her to sleep. Um, can I change that behaviour? Yes, absolutely. Because um, uh, if it happens a lot, if it's a sleepwalk, in other words, if she's not responding to you, you haven't got a lot of choice, you need to take her back because it's not, she's not doing it on purpose. Can you stop the behaviour? Well, if it's a behaviour, a sleepwalking behaviour, the only way that I know to stop it is to time it. Now, sleepwalking only happens in deep sleep. So you've got, as a toddler, a deep sleep block at the beginning of the night and a deep sleep block in the middle of the night. 
If you're pretty sure it's a sleep behaviour, sleep walking behaviour, she'll come to your room, you'll talk to her. She won't respond. What did you have for dinner, Johnny? Blue truck. Mm, Johnny's not awake. So then you know that you don't, there's no point in doing any behaviour stuff because I haven't got it. If Johnny says spaghetti bolognese, you kind of go, okay, I've got you. I know what's going on here. Go you back to bed and you can do a behavioural plan. If it's a, a sleepwalker all the time, find out what time they go to sleep, time what time it is that they come to your room, and then you can wake them up a quarter of an hour beforehand, if indeed it's a regular thing. So go to bed at 7, I'm guessing. Have their episode at 9.15, 9.20, 9 o'clock. So once you've got that time, you've worked that out a little bit, Wake her up at quarter to nine. Love you, sweetheart. Give me a kiss. You've broken the sleep cycle. She won't have it again in that sleep cycle. Unfortunately, I did that with a child and I went to the next sleep cycle and then the next one. We got rid of it eventually. You just kind of jump around a bit. So that's the only way you can do it for a nightmare. Oh, sorry, night terror. Yeah? Okay, so I'm... Um, thank you very much for coming and uh, getting through this hot night. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you. Please. Join with me.